I thank you for coming out. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this today, like you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so Michelle Chan is going to uh, play works by black female composers, Margaret Barnes and Florence Price, yeah. and weave those with some romantic uh, co compositions. Mm -hmm. On your show, Melanated Moments, you also uh, put a lot of focus on black composers. Mm -hmm. And you've had episodes on both Margaret Bonds and Florence Price. Very true. So I want to talk about Margaret Bonds first. And, and uh, my question is, you know, she's most known, the people that do know her, for composing songs, uh, you know, in collaboration with Langston Hughes mm -hmm. and Leotine mm -hmm. Price. Uh, but before all that, she was an acclaimed pianist. She yeah. opened for the Chicago Symphony, right? Yes, so yes. So can you talk about her uh, performing career? Absolutely. Uh, it's really exciting just to talk about Margaret Bonds in general. I mean, she is a, a fascinating woman. And before we can get to the performance career and all that, we kind of have to start like from the very beginning. Uh, because if we expand the definition of performance to include maybe exhibition, uh, her performance is so multifaceted. So yes, she is a composer. She is a solo pianist but she was a well-known community organizer, social justice advocate, and um, just all around like wonder kind when it comes to that. So she's doing all of these things, and that makes her a preservationist, right? Not just as a performer, but as a composer, but leaving something tangible behind for folks who are coming behind her in the world of classical music. Uh, she's born in 1913, which I think is a really, this is an interesting time in, for, for the United States specifically, right? We are, I don't know, like 50 years and some change removed from the end of the American Civil War and the emancipation of enslaved peoples. She's born one year before the start of World War I, and she is a child when women finally get the right to vote, and she's living through the stock market crash and the roaring 20s and, you know, the, you know, the whole Harlem Renaissance and, and on and on. So she's very much a product of her time, and her music is, is all about that. So... She, she begins piano at age five, but she's growing up in the segregated part of Chicago. And she's born into a family that is a part of this growing and burgeoning black middle and upper class. And for that reason, this is where she first meets Florence Price, who becomes her mentor and all that, through her, her family, who are essentially holding court with the premier writers and artists and philosophers and social change makers and thought leaders. So there's no way that these things can't be infused in her music, right? Um, she's composing by the age of 13. And then at the age of 16, she enrolls and is accepted to Northwestern University for her bachelor's in music. And she also gets her master's in music there and finishes that in 1934. And it's at Northwestern where she becomes really well known as being a, a really prodigious classical pianist, of course, playing the European canon, but she really had a hard time being in Chicago and Northwestern uh, University. It was a very hostile time for her, um, very racially charged. This is the 30s, right? So we have lynchings that are happening all over the United States, and we like to think that, like, oh, you're in the North, so Jim Crow doesn't apply here, and the Northern cities are so much more welcoming, and everyone's walking through the same front door, and that's, that's not what's happening. And so there's a very traumatic experiences, multiple traumatic experiences that she has there due to violent racial discrimination within and outside of classical music and higher education. And that really sticks with her and really becomes a, a sticking point in her music, what she collaborates, who she collaborates with, and what she does. And so I think that's really important to remember. But in this time, this is how I love how the universe works. We have so much adversity and things to overcome, but at the same time, when she's becoming very well known, it's in 1933, where she is the first black musician, period, in history, to be a featured soloist with the Chicago Symphony. So I think this is a wonderful way of looking at how artists of color, black musicians specifically, are always living both sides of the coin simultaneously, right? And so we have abject adversity, but also finding ways and means in which to excel and stand out and kind of be those torchbearers for folks who are coming through. Um, and so in Chicago, she continues to make her name for herself with that. She starts the, the Allied Arts Alliance, I think, in 1936, which is an academy that she founded specifically for teaching ballet, music, and art to black kids of Chicago. Um, she's in an institution that doesn't want her there, and she knows that, 
and she's kicking open doors, but at the same time when she's done with all that, she's like, all right, I'm going to build my own thing so the doors and windows are open for people in her community. And she does that when she moves to New York in the 1940s, meets up with Langston Hughes, and they do all these awesome art songs. And she, you know, is world renowned and has this very famous 1952 concert at uh, Town Hall in New York City where she premieres her spiritual suite, Troubled Water, which is on this program. So everywhere she goes, she is leaving tangible touch points and landmarks for those who are coming after her, whether she knows them or not. So she's fascinating. I can talk about this all day long, um, and I usually do. So again, she's way more than a performer. She's way more than a composer. I mean, she is the Renaissance woman of classical music for black people. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, as you mentioned, uh, in um, Michelle Kahn's concert, Comet Pier at Indiana Landmarks, um, she's going to perform Troubled Water by mm -hmm. Marjorie Barnes, uh, based upon the spiritual wave in the water. Yes. Um, do you feel it's important um, for, for someone performing this piece to connect first with that spiritual, that vocal work? Absolutely. I think that's the artist's duty and responsibility to conceptualize, think, perform, and execute as comprehensively as possible. Um, it's a piece that I play. I love it. It is just virtuosic as I'll get out, and it's so fun and so gripping. Um, I grew up in the black church, Young Baptist Church and all that, and so this is a piece that we, we all know. There's such a haunting beauty to it. Um, and so for those who come from that culture and that community, it's very, very familiar. But then again, it's like taking any other piece by any other composer, whether there's lyrics or not, and really doing your due diligence to understand the history, the lyrics behind, and seeing where the composer infuses, adapts, and arranges those things that are on that. And so it is important to, to understand what the piece is saying, even though the words are not there. That's gonna help with nuance, that helps pull out that tension, it helps you to kind of lay back, there's this really gorgeous, like pastoral middle part of Troubled Water, and really helps you give those dynamic contrasts, but these are all reflections of a social environment in which she has grown up in, her predecessors have, and we see the evolution of that uh, for the generations that, that have come afterwards as well. So you absolutely do, um, you almost can't help it, I think it's, it's hard not to get wrapped up into the history and then the, the lyrics and the meaning of all this. Uh, so done that way, it becomes the most comprehensive expression of taking her thoughts and ideas and, and repackaging them for the 21st century or just in general, so yes. Do you have any um, other thoughts? I, I know that now you're working on some of uh, the other yes. spirituals. Yes. Uh, do you have any other thoughts on the importance of playing those or in, in how you, you prepare? You know, the world of spirituals came a little bit late to me. Um, and some of that has to do with my upbringing as well. Sometimes you hear them and I'm just like, I don't want to play or hear these ever again. Uh, however, getting older and understanding the root of spirituals, um, you know, it is, it's the root and the cornerstone of all African-American music. It is the root and one of the foundational pillars of American music. And by American, I mean specific to the United States. Um, so whether you're talking about hip hop and rap or, rap or punk and funk or rock and roll and blues and folk, you know, that, that through a line goes back to spirituals. And spirituals found their home in the black church because this was at the, you know, 1700s, 1800s. This is the only place when religion became allowed for us to gather, this is where it finds its home. And the black church serves as the institution, not just for spirituality, but for thought leaders and philosophers, for political and social mobilizers, clearly the arts and culture and music. But um, this is the, the shaping and the institution that black people have predominantly from the 1700s through probably like the mid 20th century. Um, because schools and education centers are not as open. And so that's why you do see such a heavy reliance on gospel and spirituals that are woven into so many of these works because that's home base and, and a lot of the messaging comes from that. So having that idea and having that understanding in history has done for me, has helped to reframe spirituals within their religious context, but also outside of it. You know, these are explaining social conditions and possibly uh, social strategies in which to overcome marginalization, discrimination, and, and adversity. Michelle yes. discovered the music of Florence 
price rather late in her musical upbringing, mm -hmm. but now is considered kind of worldwide to be a champion of her music. Right. Your podcast, Melanated Moments in Classical Music, similarly seems to bring the work of Black composers into the limelight. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you travel and you perform a, lo a lot yeah. around the country. Um, are we making progress in, in elevating these works? Somewhat. Um, I'm reminded this was in February and early March of 2020. I had the, the wonderful opportunity to um, have a residency at the Africana Studies Center for, for Music and Society in Boston at the Berklee School of Music. And I interviewed a fabulous violist and uh, co-founder and executive director of an arts and culture organization there called Castle of Our Skins. And I had posed somewhat of a similar uh, question to her. And she was saying that, you know, it's very important for us to remember that the work that we are doing is part of a, of a broader cycle. And in that cycle, you have crests, and then you have moments where, where, where there is not that. And just how important it is for patrons, for performers and arts administrators to recognize and understand where we are in that cycle. Um, we've recently just, you know, kind of had a flashpoint um, between the pandemic, between fallout and reverberation from, the, uh, from George Floyd's, uh, you know, let's call it what it is, murder. Um, and so these things come together along with the pandemic, right, where, where we have to do something. And so perhaps we are at this crest where there's visibility, things have boiled over, and for better or for worse, there's been creation of word salad and equity statements that say what needs to be done. But I take the James Baldwin approach where I'm kind of like, I, uh, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. And so I think um, it's very easy to say, yes, we're making progress because most of these orchestras and, and, and civic centers, they're just now opening again, right? So seasons are just now starting. And wonderfully and thankfully, there are composers of African descent that are on these programs. However, I am way more interested in seeing what happens in two to five to 10 to 15 seasons from now. Um, and so we will see. I, um, I don't know, it might be a defense mechanism. I'm like chronically skeptical, but I always remain hopeful. And the genre of classical music and music education is part of a broader ecosystem. So yes, there are the symphony centers and the Carnegie Halls and you know, the landmark centers and whatnot. However, young people start anywhere from age three, four, and five. And if we're not intentionally programming these works on student recitals from K through 12 and undergrad and, uh, and, and graduate work, then that means they're not gonna be making it to the books that we get that are standard repertoire and audition materials for these major symphony orchestras. So no, it's not gonna be enough just to have season upon season at the, at the top of this industry. It needs to be a top down and bottom up approach as well. And so if kindergartners aren't getting this, and you know, eighth graders, high schoolers, and, and undergrad, then, it, then no, we're not. Um, I think that is changing with social media and just how connected we realize we can be. I am one of so many, many people around the country and the world who are doing exactly this and have always been doing this. And so we'll see. If we're at the top of this crest, then we're gonna ride it out. If we are on the way down, then it's my responsibility to make sure there's enough energy and push and effort to bring that crest back and make sure the gaps in between are not as, as broad and as long as they have been, if that makes sense. It does, it does, I, because I was going to ask you, how do we make classical music more inclusive? And you're right, it's not just, you know, having the halls program, but it's, it, it needs to be at the the education, the young levels too. Right, it's not a either or, it's a yes and uh, type of approach to it. I, I enjoy the way I like to do things. Um, sometimes we can hit classical music on the nose and that's very helpful. Other times it's, it becomes easier for people to digest, understand, or find new interests where maybe there wasn't any using some of those cultural connectivity methods. But then also, um, I didn't really like history growing up. But now I've found a soundtrack that kind of interweaves you know, social movements and history, and now I care why, what's going on in you know, World War I in Germany, and then at the same time happening in the United States and the French West Indies. It makes us all way more connected and actually tells a story that makes a lot more sense 
is way more broader and is telling the complete global story of uh, humankind, but also just certain peoples, I think. So um, you can hit it on the nose if you want. Sometimes you don't, you don't have to, you know? So that's, that's kind of a fun approach to kind of keep it, keep people on their toes. You're either gonna get a music history lesson or you're just, or we'll just play music. I don't know, it's, it's, it's possibilities and opportunities are there for all of it. Yes. Wonderful. Joshua, any, anything else to add? Um, you know, and I, I, I applaud the American Pianist Association for making good and beginning the work uh, to be more expansive and inclusive. And that includes skin deep and, and beyond that as well. And you're gonna enjoy Michelle Can. It is a incredible program and the stories that she is weaving together through music make perfect sense. They're in harmony and she's not coming to play with y'all. I mean, these are rigorous pieces and she's about to get down to business and you will absolutely love it and, and hopefully have a couple more composers that readily come to mind when you think of classical music. Awesome, all right, well, Joshua, thank you. And we'll thank see you, you uh, in May. Absolutely, thank you much. <laughs>